Good evening. I am Dorothea Baer, the head of the landscape architecture section here at Norton School. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, um, John Peterson. John has taught at the California College of Arts and the University of Texas at Austin. He was the principal of Peterson Architects from 1993 to 2012, even though he says design doesn't matter. And before that, worked for landscape architecture firms, including that of Michael Van Valkenburg. He began as a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design, where he met, actually, uh, Mike Cadwell, and he studied architecture, and then became a Loeb Fellow at Harvard University in 2005-2006. It kind of goes from the uh, rogue Ivy League to the uh, very official Ivy League. Um, John Peterson is currently the president of Public Architecture, a non-profit organization based in San Francisco, which he founded in 2002, uh, the organization of the city. Um, described as a new model for architectural practice where architects can work for the public good, public architecture identifies questions, problems, and needs, and in turn facilitates design and financing par partnerships. It is based on the 1% pro bono model of legal firms, asking that architects donate 1% of their billable hours to the design of public spaces and amenities. The 1% idea is decep deceptively simple. It connects practitioners willing to give 1% of their time with a non-profit organization in need of design assistance. Based on a 40-hour work week, and that's maybe where the uh, utopia in lies, uh, the, what architect or landscape architect has a 40-hour work week. 1% represents a modest 20 hours per year per person. In turn, should all design practitioners contribute, and that's where you want to kind of the, the, the freedom music going on, you know, John Lennon imagined and so forth, they would offer the output of a mega office working exclusively for the public good. The transformation of the practice mantra of billable hours, which is certainly familiar to anybody who's worked in a firm, into a productive non-monetary exchange is one that has gained traction. Public architecture has established connections with the Ford Foundation and the Kresge Foundation, to name a few. It was recognized nationally and internationally from the AIA to Holcim. But perhaps more importantly, it has encouraged alternative modes of practice and expanded the definition of traditional ones. As many good ideas, the idea for public architecture was born from frustration and a very concrete design problem right outside the then office of Peterson Architects. First, the frustration. The story goes that in looking for ways to reinvigorate his own design thinking and that of his employees, John considered entering a design competition and instead took off on a tangent how many hours designers spend on producing massive numbers of drawings for competitions, how little time jurors could devote to reviewing these innumerable projects, what happens to these projects, etc., etc. And instead of indulging on what could have been a rather depressing reflection on the futility of design competitions, John and his staff focused instead on a more tangible problem, an open space strategy for the neighborhood of South of Market in San Francisco, right where their office was. This effort led them to interact with multiple city agencies, community leaders, and ultimately influence the San Francisco Rincon Hill Plan. It was the beginning of the 1% idea. Since then, public architecture has facilitated the funding of community projects, public spaces, design projects such as a scrap house, a temporary dwelling built of salvage materials, and the day labor station for migrant workers, and even occasionally, I believe, entered a design competition. In the end, you may ask why would the head of the landscape architecture section host a representative of the other species, an yeah. architect? Yeah. <laughs> In part, you have workshops like the one we had this morning with undergraduates and graduates from landscape architecture, architecture, and city and regional planning. But the answer also lies in public architecture speculation on alternative modes of practice. Seemingly occupying the peripheral territory of design professions, it holds promise for change. I will indulge in the diversion of a commentary on the relation of gender to periphery by Judith Butler to stipulate that what is outside is not simply the other but what is outside is the notion of the not yet. The not yet and the periphery could be seen as the anti-specialty, the gray zone between disciplines, an evolving practice in which professional boundaries are no longer so well defined and teamwork is essential. Things are set in motion and on the verge. Check it out and welcome John Peterson. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. All right. So, thank you, Dorothy. 
Center is a nonprofit. We're in San Francisco as our home base, but uh, it's national in, in scope. And I'll tell you more about uh, the, the part that's, that's more national. So this is the, the, the first image. This is the first project we did. My private practice was, was small, about 10 or 11 people. Um, and our work was starting to get more. We're doing mostly high residential. Uh, very different from where public artwork is up now. Uh, and most of our residential, but we were trying to get work that was uh, increasing in scale. So we, we had a project in particular that was a mixed use project in a neighborhood. It was the largest building, and it would have been the largest building in the neighborhood. I had a grocery store, a branch library, and housing. And this was coming from, as I mentioned, mostly high residential or small commercial. Uh, uh, project and this project had an impact on the entire neighborhood and, and, and had an impact on people that I would never meet. And so I went from a very intimate relationship to the user, um, uh, again, small projects, to a not intimate relationship with the user. I had to think about how we, how we serve those folks that we will never uh, meet. And it started. Uh, to open up what was clearly end up interesting myself uh, around our role beyond the limits of the building, our role in the neighborhood and things like that. And, and it, it should be it should be made clear, I was not in Sua who was the graduate in 1990 at a time when there was essentially zero conversation about social impact and design. In fact, social issues in design, we're seen as distractions from the clarity of the design work. As, as I, I saw it, I don't think that's a big exaggeration. Uh, and I, I sort of bought that book, book on the sinker, and, uh, and that's why I was really interested in the higher residential where I spent a great deal of time with my clients looking at, at the refined details of projects, the um, uh, way of mostly thinking about more complex things about social engagement or social justice or these really squishy, complicated uh, ideas. So, so in that, uh, at that moment, um, when we had these sort of larger problems, we were giving a larger project, that one in particular was in a neighborhood in San Francisco, one of the I wanted to accelerate my learning and our firm's learning around issues that, that are you know, outside the limits of, of our, our uh, design piece. And so, as Berkeley said, I looked at, uh, uh, at every competition, which is what I thought I really did. And when somebody wanted to do this kind of thing, I wanted to jump out of their client pool. Um, and, and quickly decided that it, it seemed like a pretty odd deal. Uh, these open competitions and the chances of all the work that they do. So I thought, well, essentially, we can create the only, you know, our own environment for a competition. And we'll be the, the sole applicant that we can carry from the And in fact, that's, that's all essentially what happened. Um, so we just took a problem in our neighborhood. The problem was that there wasn't enough open space in South Market, which is a light industrial area of San Francisco. Uh, warehouses on industrial, like everybody in the city has. It now was a change. It was in transition. Light industry was moving out of the cities. Um, and so we had this very complex mix of uses and, and building types. And it's one of the most diverse areas of San Francisco. Diversity uh, already. Uh, and so, this you know, co collision that's the federal building uh, uh, by uh, uh next to these little small warehouses. And so, we said, well, what would be a network of open space in that kind of condition? And we wanted to be very rigorous about it and look at the politics, the local politics of it, um, look at the the funding mechanism. And so just to sort of move through it quickly, it became clear that the only viable real estate to do such a thing is going to be in the street right away. Uh, if you really were going to be serious about uh, making something happen. Yeah. So we looked at taking over parking spaces and turning them into bits, little bits of open space, and then pairing that with a, an adjacent user. So a, a, a store, a, Mixed use housing, whatever it might be. And we developed this kit of parts. We said, well, there could be lots of different things. It all depends on what the adjacent user is. And so, you know, it would be a little outdoor cafe or this 
see you in Afro Pepe. Um, Sally Market uh, is also the, the, the fetish leather district of San Francisco. And so, and it's real. It's a real part of the city. And, and one of the things we like to say is, you know, there's sort of real solutions for real San Francisco. So this, uh, so the muscle gym here, this thing in the middle, um, it was in sea guns, kind of like a bad speech in front of one of the leather bars. You know. <laughs> so, again, you know, we were sort of serious about dog park, you know, and how people who were living in the light natural area um, <coughs> get dogs. And, and that was never, that, that uh, the urban environment was never, never prepared for that. So, and then we got interested in this idea of, of, of a, of a responsive proposal as opposed to a prescriptive proposal in urban thinking. Most urban is one is prescriptive in nature. We want something, uh, we want an urban plaza that does these things. We essentially are prescriptive about what the activity will be. And so could we create something that was actually responsive and not prescriptive and let people make up their own minds about what these bits of open spaces do? And so you can imagine, wow, this city parks. Oh well, it does. Anyway, there's a city grid in there. At least on my my left up. Um, and the idea is could this grow slowly over time? And could we rethink the nature of open space? And so we thought, oh, well, how does this compare to something like Central Park? If we have a, a similar number of activities that Central Park had, but at a fraction of the price and a fraction of the impact of the existing land use. And so this is an example um, that we did in front of uh, the Vermont Cafe. It was an icon in the neighborhood. It's got, it's got a um, uh, fire swale to keep um, the water off uh, from the city in the bay. And so we made this proposal, and sure enough, the city got rid of it, and they have to take a and a bunch of agencies got very interested in this, and I thought, wow, this is so simple and so much fun. Why aren't we doing this all the time? And start asking questions about what firms out there are doing this kind of thinking, where they're not only coming up with a solution, they're coming up with a problem. And begin to realize that it really wasn't something that the person does very much. Um, and there were some there were some original examples. The CDC network of, of community design uh, centers uh, that, were, that were built in the 60s and 70s were, were sort of doing this stuff, but not quite. And in a, in a moment of, of naive ambition and, and, and bad behavior, I decided to start a nonprofit, and this is what we could do. I had no idea what I was doing, I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, but simply decided to give it a go. Um, I'm going to get back to that, but I'm going to talk about this. So this is really pretty smart. Uh, it, 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 it kept in mind a lot of things like the political environment, where big change would have been very difficult to do. So it's a sort of small, incremental thing. Uh, we look at the financial component of this, but we missed one big problem. We, we, we didn't understand something that was better than this, that, that was, a, was a deal plan. And then these guys. These guys, do you know what this is? This is parking day, the very first parking day. Are you guys familiar with parking day? Um, okay, so uh, it's actually, I'm, in, I'm not sure why it hasn't been here yet, but it's, it's moved around the country now around the world. Um, it, it was created by three, um, three folks. It was created by three folks, uh, uh, two landscape architects and one artist. Um, and they were all at full-time jobs, and they were doing this on the side. And they came up with this idea of, of putting coins in the meter and creating a little park that was temporary, and they just sat on lawn chairs or you know, park bench, and they used it for as many hours as they put the coins in. Well, that started this chain of action, and now this is like on 40 cities all over the world. It's one day every year called Parking Day. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have more images, but it, 
gets really elaborate. But they do it in the day. And that, the idea of temporary was the thing that we missed because our proposal was poured in place concrete or whatever we think make it permanent. And the street right away, at least in San Francisco and probably in many places, is, is the domain outside of the Department of Public Works and the typical permit. This would have, the, our proposal for every single one of those little bits of open space would have had to go in front of the board of supervisors for, for a public vote. And it never would have happened. But temporary, it can't. It, 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 it skirts around the typical approval process. And now these things, there's something like 48 of these things in the city of San Francisco, and, they, and they've, they've been done parklets. And so there's, and each one is different, and it, it does exactly the kinds of things that we had thought about, but we hadn't thought it through. And, um, and, and Rebar and the and Parking Day figured it out, and we didn't. So the next project we took on, again, still in this, in this uh, mode of identifying projects and then seeking solutions, was were day laborers. Are there day laborers in, in uh, Columbus? Guys that's on the street who are looking for day work? Some? Uh, they're all over the country. There's something like 170,000 most of them are women, uh, particularly in the garment industry of New York, who have been And then there's a whole network of women who do day um, house cleaning, and they, they do it not by cleaning corners, they do it in the network itself. Um, but we became interested in how could we look at built environment issues associated with the challenges that the day laborers were facing. And this is you know, over 10 years ago when we were looking at this. So uh, many of these guys are illegal. Um, uh, there's some challenges associated with, uh, uh, with their seeking work and the neighborhoods that are seeking work. Uh, and there's some friction, uh, in some cases quite a bit, in places like Arizona, an uh, enormous amount uh, in parts of Texas. Uh, but they're, they're a big part, or they're a part of our uh, economy. In some cases, uh, in some economies, local economies are a big part of, of that economy. So this is a proposal that we made um, uh, in LA, uh, in Harbor City, which is the neighborhood of LA. And this is actually um, uh, a large day labor site, it serves almost 200 day laborers uh, a day. Um, and so it's a, it's a way of looking at how the environment in which these guys seek work has an impact on their ability to find work on how they're treated within the community. Um, it addresses issues like crime that, that are, are they are actually most of the victims of crime. Very, very few uh, incidents of day laborers committing crime. The conversation that we would have, we ended up in conversation with about 14 municipalities around the country who approached us when this uh, got uh, some publicity through uh, uh, an exhibition of Cooper Hewitt. The most common phone call came from the police department, not because they were trying to police these guys, they were trying to protect these guys, because most of them didn't trust the bank and they kept cash in their pocket and they were in love. So they saw this as a way of possibly being able to manage the crime in their community. The smart ones do it at least. So uh, I, I'm breezing over this stuff, but I just want to give you video a sense. And this is the last, I think, project in the sort of early phase. And, and I already mentioned this one. Uh, and this was not our idea. I got a phone call from the chief building inspector in San Francisco who uh, was having a meeting with a filmmaker who had an idea to build a house from 100% junk. Uh, he said, great, let's do it for World Environment Day, which was happening in San Francisco. He called me up and said, can you guys design this thing? Uh, and then another week moment, I said yes. And then he told, told us that, uh, we had six weeks before the uh, 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 World Environment Day. And uh, so this was conceived of, designed, and built in six weeks. 
and became a uh, subject of an hour-long um, uh, National Geographic documentary film. Uh, lots of footage of uh, contractors uh, uh, series, uh, which is quite true. Um, and in fact, I'm accused of being on crack cocaine. Do you want to check that out? Um, uh, and that led to a document uh, that was funded by the uh, USGC to help designers and contractors incorporate salvage material in their, uh, in their work. That was less a piece of architecture and more a piece of theater, which was actually a little bit less than for us. It had an incredibly simple message, and we were able, there were something like 150 volunteers. Um, all the stuff in the seal that was used to create that house came from the port, from the, the airport, salvage yard, from salvage yards all over. And we could do crazy things like um, we realized we needed a crane uh, in a couple of hours to lift some of the water, water pieces. And we could make a phone call to some crane operator business and say, we're building a house out of junk in front of City Hall, which is where it was built. Uh, uh, from 100% junk, you come and help us. And we could get help because it's a simple message. Architects, landscape architects, the iron building department, often like to have very complex messages because they see their work as being complex. But simple, simple messages, and the work is complex, but simple messages have power and, and are easily, e easy to communicate. So that was the early work, um, mostly uh, a little on the gorilla side, uh, relatively small in scale, and really fine grade. The challenge of it was when you act as your own client, the time it takes to actually build something except for you know, a house out of junk is very long. Because uh, you have to fill all the roles of both designer and client. But to fundraise for it, you have to get all the entitlement approvals, you have to go through this long process. And our little organization, which was at that time funded by my private practice, which wasn't that big. Private practices, as you may know, don't pay. Um, I couldn't sustain those projects in that that was the only projects we could do. That was a lesson learned. Someone else could figure this out, I couldn't. So our projects shifted. As we got more exposure, as we learned more about how to look at issues, social issues, and the built environment, we started getting hired to do much more, much larger scale projects. Um, that were really interesting to do. And we have done less of the projects that we started, which were these, these proactive projects where we, we not only developed a solution, but we developed a problem, or we identified the problem. So this is, this is one we're working on right now. Um, and this was brought to us by a foundation who was working with the head of a public health department in Allegheny County, one of the county in California, actually right across the bay from San Francisco, and he had an idea of using, he like any other public health agency, is frustrated because they can't get uh, primary medical care to, the, to those that most need it. The most marginalized people, the poorest people, those that are, are unsure and afraid to use the system, they, they have the hardest time he had an idea of using the network of fire stations and placing a health, uh, a health clinic within a fire station. And it had a couple of brilliant components. There's this wonderful network of fire stations across the United States that are geographically uh, distributed by population. Fire stations and firefighters are an integral part of the healthcare system uh, already. 83% of their uh, calls are medical related, only 70% are fire related anymore. Um, I would say because we've gotten good at, at protecting building assets from fire, uh, the fire department would say, no, we do exactly not the same amount, but we're just doing all these other things uh, too. Uh, but that's beneficial for them to say that. Um, and they're very good. 
so, uh, so they're already, you can't be a firefighter in this country pretty much without having medical training, at least an EMT or a So they were already in the system. So all we had, what we were hired to do was look at this, this strategy behind this. Could you do this? How would it work? Um, how do we look at that set of, uh, of uh, challenges and components? And then, could we, how could we do this intelligently so that we had some sense that it would work and then we could test it over time? And so, one of the things we started doing is we, we collected you know, big data that was already available to us. We just had to go and find it. And then we could take GIS information and other, and we could look at all the drivers for those that weren't using the mainstream uh, healthcare uh, uh, resources, they were using the emergency healthcare resources. So they were, they were going to the emergency department rather than going to a primary care uh, physician, or they weren't getting treated or getting diagnosed at all. So we could overlay all this data, and then we could pinpoint exactly where we wanted to place the clinic. <coughs> And then we could look, where's the nearest fire station? There's, there was our site. So we did the assessment of this uh, and looked at the network of fire stations. What are the variables? How would you begin to, to catalog them and think through these? And then, then how could you give instructions for Allegheny County and others to figure out where to place these things once they've identified the need? And then, the next stage of this is we developed a prototype as a way of illustrating the thinking behind um, uh, placing these, uh, uh, these clinics. And so we're looking here at the site conditions and how do we have a larger impact on the neighborhood and we provide usable open space, those kinds of amenities. And also looking at the, the floor plan and ways of where Alvin County is actually, uh, has, has driven very uh, amenable weather. And so can we use the, the waiting room and the outdoor space adjacent to it and we extend the waiting room to the outdoor space so that you can have a much more gracious experience? Can we start to lose the barrier between the receptionist and the uh, patients? Can we use... Um, uh, online tools that are accessible while you're in the waiting room to, to learn about uh, drugs that have been prescribed or to set an appointment or your next appointment. Anyway, so we're looking at different uh, strategies and trying to communicate to, to folks who will take this on hopefully well beyond the specific design solutions that we'll, we'll create. And we did this with by inviting architects that were, could do, we felt a better job than we could. In this case, WRN Studio in San Francisco and GLS uh, uh, landscape architects, uh, Gary Strang in San Francisco, with a graphic designer, uh, Jeremy Mendy. And then we're looking at strategies of, of using the green roof to be responsive to local conditions. And could we have a, a kind of iconic form and then could you clad it with different materials so that it's, that it's responsive to local needs? This is a sort of cartoonish uh, illustration of that, um, but uh, it, it sort of conveys an idea. And finally, this is a single slide I'm just going to mention. This is actually the project we're working on most uh, aggressively at the moment. And this is uh, helping to develop the core principles for a new major university in one of the poorest parts of the United States, the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. So I'm trying to give you an example of having gone from trying to solve a problem in our neighborhood to looking at the impact of a new major regional university in a poor part of the US. Um, and how our role has changed, uh, how the value of what we has changed. This is funded uh, by Ford Foundation. Our work here is funded by Ford Foundation, uh, the Annie, Annie Casey Foundation, and uh, uh, we'll a little bit of luck. Uh, we're about to sign a contract with the University of Texas system itself um, to extend the work that we're doing.
talking about policies and practices, not talking about buildings, though that those policies and practices will ultimately lead to, ultimately lead to decisions in the built environment. We're also looking at pedagogy, we're looking at service learning, we're looking at economic development, uh, health outcomes. So the team of people that we have pulled together, there's over 25 institutions as part of the team of experts that we pulled together to help support the work in this. So we've gone from designers of building the thousands made of junk to really we do something very simple now. We help frame problems, how the built environment has a role in social outcomes. We build teams of people that, that have the knowledge that we know to, to bring to bear. And then we manage that team to make sure we get an outcome that serves the original problem space. And that's what we do on the project. Fine. The other part of, of public architecture that we have the initiative uh, is the institutionalization of program and service within the within practice of uh, within the practice of architecture, landscape architecture, and all the designers of the built environment. It's called the one percent program. Um, we're about to change the name. We have to rename it the one percent program. The occupied movement hadn't named the one percent <laughs> something else, um, and we our our branding skills uh, are a bit outmatched by. Uh, have people more powerful than us. Um, but the idea was simple. Ask every design professional in the, in the country to give a minimum of 1% of the time to a product of service um, for the first time in history. Um, we're now, and this is an old map, uh, it, it always is our old We're always growing. Uh, we're now in all 50 states. There are now over 18,000 designers in the program, over 1,300 firms, doing over $60 million in pro bono services annually. And we're just scratching the surface. But now we have this very large network of, of designers doing work within mostly the social sector, so nonprofits, and some in government, but mostly the nonprofits. So why would we do this? Uh, and came up with this program in, within less within less than a year of the original concept of public architecture. We were already beginning to see the limitation of those early projects. What we began to see is an opportunity, or maybe the responsibility, given where we were and what we were thinking about, to have an impact on the profession as a whole. And Provono service was simply seen as a tool to get something much larger. It was seen as a kind of big way to the, the problem that we had identified, and, and we're not going on, but the problem that we had identified is that as designers, we were only serving, this is going to be news, a small segment of the population. And we a small segment of the work that was going out there. And who was in charge of the work that we weren't touching? Primarily the social sectors, the nonprofits uh, uh, in this country. And we realized that if we were ever going to work in some of the most engaging and impactful environments for social change, we were going to have to become much more friendlier with the social sector. And how would we do that? Well, pro bono service is an easy way to do it. Once you strip away the, the financial implication, it allows you to open the doors to build relationships, to doing projects, to learning about the players within the social sector, about the kinds of projects that are available, about the kind of design skills you need to work in those environments. So underserved environments, we don't really actually know all that much about because by definition, we don't serve them. So the design, as designers, we think of ourselves as being so flexible in our mind, in our ability to address whatever comes at us. But the fact of the matter is, we mostly serve a very narrow cultural set in this country. And once we get out of that, the assumptions that we make about how people respond start to break down a little bit. 
It's not that we can't do it. It's not that we can't do it very well. It's that, in fact, we just have a lot to learn. And, and pro bono was meant, again, to be this stepping stone to a much bigger idea, which I'll talk a little more about. So I want to just talk a little bit at this point about, um, about what are social outcomes. So these are the kinds of things that we talk about here in the team when we, as architects, you know, involved in our work. Uh, we talk about job creation. We talk about enhancing a program. Oh, we're going to make a better library. Uh, we talk about cultural relevance. Oh, you know, uh, the library, the civic center, these things will be better. They'll, they'll be more culturally relevant. Um, they'll bring pleasure. Uh, they'll be beautiful. And the user experience will go up. These are all great things. But if now if you remember the experience that I gave in the beginning, these are also the things that we should be talking about. Very specific. Because we, we have impact on this. Because again, we're designers of the built environment. We're wielding the power of the built environment. So we have enormous impacts on obesity right now. I can, I can spend the next 45 minutes talking just about how we can impact obesity in this country. Uh, poverty we can have an impact on, uh, you know, reading scores are pretty healthy. Simply introducing natural light uh, into environments. There's just a new study that came out. Uh, if you're in a workplace environment that has a window, you will get, on average, 46 minutes more sleep than someone who has a workplace environment without it. So these are the kinds of things that we need to incorporate into our work and the way we talk about it. And here's what we're, this is the list that we have. This is what social impact is for the design of the built environment. These are the things you can look at any project you're working on and you can measure it based on these six items. You can do a law office interior and have impact on these items. Maybe the model you can have on a lot of health outcomes. I've already talked about health outcomes. And just simply natural light and workplace environment it goes on and on. Every project you can you can put uh, that filter to, and you can ask those questions. And I think we should do that. But let's not be carried away and think that something like having an impact on crime rates means that we can't be committed to things like beauty and poetics of the work that we do. This is uh, this is the dichotomy, failed dichotomy of the sixty. The social progressives and the design progressives don't sleep together. They stand on opposite ends of the dance floor. Uh, this was a big mistake. And, and we're still carrying the bad behavior of that idea, that those are two uh, independent things. And we need to think about this beyond philanthropy. This is not just about doing good. This needs to be incorporated into practice. And yes, sometimes being philanthropic is a great thing to do, a smart thing to do, and uh, a generous thing to do. But it cannot be limited to just <coughs> So the pro bono work can't just be, oh, well, we do all this other work. It doesn't, we don't think about social outcomes and all the rest of our work, but 1% of the work we do for pro bono, we do think about it. That's not good enough. And so back to this idea of who are we serving, this is a this is the, who we serve as designers is a guess that you've seen maybe before, certainly it's out there. But Cooper Hewitt, who's had a couple of shows called Design for the Other 90%, <coughs> sets the design community's service to 10% of the population. Um, Brian Bell, at Design Corps, has estimated at 2% of the population. I don't know what it is. I think it's more than 10%, but I can tell you it's a relatively small percentage. That means our profession, your profession, is serving some small wedge, and there's some big ass wedge that you're not serving, unless you want to. And that's a choice. Because there's an economy that we have access to, but we have not access to at least very well. There are over one and a half million nonprofits in, in the United States. It's a $1.8 trillion annual revenue economy. That's how much money they, they bring in and spend every year. And they employ almost 10% of the workforce in the US. 
And some of these folks are our clients, but the vast majority of them are not. So with the time I have left, which isn't a lot, I don't think I should spend that much more time, I, I want to show you some work that firms are doing, both small and large, that's beginning to blur the lines of uh, traditional practice that doesn't focus on, on uh, social outcomes and, and, and practices that, that are starting to fo focus on social outcomes. This is ISA. They're in, uh, they're in uh, Philadelphia. Um, uh, Brian Phillips uh, uh, runs this firm. Uh, and this is a project that they're doing for a CDC a community development corporation in Brooklyn. And he's doing this in partnership with um, a new organization uh, called Health by Design, run by um, uh, Rupal Songvi. And so what they're trying to do is start at the very beginning of this large, sorry, that slide, uh, of this large uh, development and start to unpack all the programmatic opportunities and look at the impact of those different components and then start to layer that into the design work from the very, very beginning. What's happening in the work that we're doing, in the end result of what we're doing, how do those things integrate into social outcomes, health and others, and then how do we design around to uh, help promote uh, those uh, outcomes? And yes, small practice. I don't know, maybe there are 10 people or something like that. Um, and they're not leading. They're not saying, like, oh, we're just social activists or architects. These guys are, are doing really interesting, forward, progressive design work. Uh, this is Interboro Partners. Uh, they're actually the other group. Uh, and I have a health partner who's working with the Texas, the firm is in Brooklyn, but Interboro is in Brooklyn. Um, really interesting uh, uh, group, I think three partners. Um, they did one of the MoMA uh, PS1 uh, summit programs. So uh, PS1 invites uh, often sort of young emerging designers to design their point yard for the summer. And so they did a really simple thing to start with, figure out what the elements of their design. They just went around to Queens and they went around and they interviewed all these folks that lived and worked in Queens in that area. And they collected what they wanted, what was happening in the world, what they wanted. So this guy ran a little ballet school, and he needed full-length mirrors for his studio. Um, this guy, I think, was a, he's like a teamster, a local 808, um, uh, wanted trees and, and stuff that they could sit outside and be in the shade. And then they catalog all these things and they said, okay, this is what we're designing. And then they built this the courtyard experience for PS1 using all those elements. Each one of them had a tag, all the elements had a tag told them where they were going. And then they were distributed around Queens. So the idea was, we're not going to throw this stuff away at the end. We're actually going to go to the community, find out what they want, take that as our, as our base elements, our materials. We're going to design something with that, and then we're going to send it back to its origin. This is one of the pieces that went to a, a preschool. And then very quickly, um, this is back to the sort of uh, uh, proactive this is still going on. I told you, sort of, we moved away from this as a as a uh, as a as a organization. Um, we still do a little bit of it. I don't know if we used to do, but there's more and more firms that are engaging in this in this stuff. Uh, this is Roll Studio, which is uh, Auburn's one of our studios. Uh, you probably run across it. it started by Sam Mockby, now run by a really extraordinary guy uh, named uh, Andrew Freer, and they've been experimenting with designing a house that costs twenty thousand dollars. They've been doing it with students, and they're on something like their 12th um, prototype. And they're, they, they're experimenting with this as a product to release out as a, as a built uh, product of purchase. 
uh, they're, it's called a 20K house. They're not being able to achieve, achieve it for $20,000. It looks like they're in about $30,000. Still, radically less, less than most anything anyone's been able to do at that, that scale. And they haven't been able to do it at scale yet, and they're just starting to try to figure out the business model to do it. This is uh, a proposal that developed, was developed by Jones for his LA office. Uh, this is Pershing Park in LA. So this is simply them saying, um, Pershing Park is, is, a, is, a, is a small part of what it could be at, as an important element to the city. Why don't we simply design something and put it out there and see if we can use it as a catalyst uh, to see some change? Just another image of that same project. And this is Gensler's DC office looking at one of the really beautiful bridges in DC that's non uh, non pedestrian. How do, we, how do we convert this to a pedestrian bridge? So these are firms experimenting with going out and doing something more than waiting for the phone to ring for the next client to hire you. And these are the guys that are sort of on the right edge, uh, interested in really fun stuff. This is Marvel Ratzinger's um, uh, sort of political arm, if you will, commentary uh, called Heavy Trash. So in their neighborhood in LA, um, there was a little park that had some homeless activity. And the, uh, the local uh, public works department decided they would solve that problem of homeless activity by putting a high fence around the whole thing, locking the gate, and walking away. So no one could use it. So Marvel Ratson, the design build firm, thought that they, they could make a, make a comment on that. And so they designed it, they built this thing off-site, assembled it on-site within just a, uh, a very short time, and then walked away themselves. Uh, and left it up for the next, I think it stayed up for six weeks or so, uh, before the public works eventually took it down. But it started a conversation in the neighborhood about, is this really the right way to deal with uh, antisocial uh, activities that we don't like? This is another project. They, they designed and printed and built these signs and installed them. There is no such thing as the octo line. Right? <laughs> but they wanted, to have, they wanted to start a conversation about why isn't there a, a better public transportation line from where they were to the beach uh, in LA. And so these were, I don't know how many of these went up, but at least more than a couple. And so they simply put them up, walked away, left the phone number for them to call. And people started calling and saying, hey, the other one, this is so great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is sort of, this is architecture as, as provocateur, or architecture as provocateur. You guys can do this anytime you want. <laughs> Here's the very last one. And you can just read it. use our work to improve people's lives 
lives, including the environment, it is good, and the environment's part of that. Um, I think we're going to continue to erode the relevance of our, of, our, of our practice and our work. And I think there's a business model behind it. So I don't think this is just doing good, do, good doer things. This is also about being a smarter, smarter. <coughs> That's it. Thank you very much.